Bill Blatty was an undergraduate at Georgetown University when all of this occurred. And he started taking notes on it. And over a 15-year period, he put together this novel. He changed the character of the, the young man into a, a, a young girl. One day, I picked it up on the road somewhere and read it, and I, I thought it was sensational. And then when he told me it was a true story, I was my curiosity was even more piqued. It's a classic story. It's a timeless story about timeless events, about the inexplicable nature of good and evil. I think The Exorcist has echoes into all of that. I think it represents the constant struggle that is alive in every human being on this planet, um, in, in that we are all a battlefield for, for good and evil. Well, it all starts in January of 49 in uh, Mount Rainier, Maryland, which is not too far from Washington, D.C. It's a small street. There are bungalows on it. In one of the bungalows, not too well off, um, but they're struggling people. There's a father and mother, a boy named Robbie, who's 13, and a grandmother. There's also another person in this situation. A frequent visitor was an aunt from St. Louis. The aunt was a spiritualist, meaning that she really does believe that when people die, they simply go to the other side and they can communicate with us, the living. They also played up the Ouija board together. And she told Robbie that the Ouija board was a way in which the living can contact people on the other side. There is a popular belief that any contact with spirits or the dead opens a gateway to evil or to the devil. And that particular bias in our society goes back to the Jewish scriptures, clear back to the time of the prophets when it was forbidden to traffic with evil spirits. And it was punishable by death. Shortly after his aunt's visit, bizarre events began to occur. One night, it's a Saturday night, the mother and father go out, the grandmother and Robbie are sitting around in the house, and they start to hear scratchings in the walls. And at first they think it's just the mice. An exterminator is brought in, they can't find any rodents, and meanwhile, night after night, the scratchings continue. And the scratchings are not all that's happening. Fruit is flying off the table. The table is turning over. Uh, chairs turn over. A vase flies through the air. And in the grandmother's room, there's a, a painting of Christ. And the painting starts to move on the wall as if somebody is behind it, pounding it. And in Robbie's own room, the mattress seems to have scratchings in it. There's even one night he says it's as if there's marching feet inside the mattress. On January the 26th, Robbie's beloved aunt died. Robbie was devastated. There's some indication that he goes back to the Ouija board and he starts fooling around the Ouija board, perhaps to try to get through to her. Robbie started to exhibit curious characteristics. At night, he was plagued by nightmares. During the day, he was becoming agitated and withdrawn. Well, this goes on for quite a while, and then the family turns to its minister, a Lutheran minister whose name is the Reverend Schultz. Schultz believes in parapsychology, the idea that objects can fly because our mind can make the objects fly. Well, while I was working at the Institute for Parapsychology, uh, I found some documents related to the case, such as the correspondence between J.B. Rand and Father Schultz. March 21st, 1949. Dr. J.B. Rand, Department of Psychology, Duke University. Dear Dr. Rand, we have in our congregation a family who are being disturbed by poltergeist phenomena. The phenomena is apparent only in the boy's presence. I had him in my home on the night of February 17th and 18th to observe for myself chairs move with him and one threw him out he took this boy into his home probably because he thought he was pulling something over on his parents in his own house and he thought get him in, in my home he can't do this as easily it's that things continued to move there he was pretty shaken up by that well he said that uh he put the boy on the bed 
And uh, when, whenever he would put the boy on the bed, the bed would begin to shake. And then he said that he made a mattress on the floor, but the mattress glided with the boy on it under the bed. I have no scientific explanation for the bed moving. And so I don't believe that science can explain that. Poltergeist phenomena surrounds uh, an adolescent, a person, who is undergoing a deep-seated stress, a psychological conflict, and somehow the energy gets transferred outside of the body by some unknown mechanism. I think it's very possible there is a scientific explanation for it that we do not yet understand, just as people in the 1600s would not have understood electricity. I had their physician place the boy in the hands of the county mental hygiene clinic under Dr. Mabel Ross of the University of Maryland. She and her staff had two interviews with the boy. He was to have gone for a third, but meantime, words appeared on the boy's body, according to the family and friends. Listen to your heart now and see how... Why Robbie never showed up for the third psychiatric assessment is not known. His parents may have been frightened off by a series of newspaper articles published that same month exposing the deplorable conditions in the state mental hospitals. There were 9,000 men, women and children crowded into wards. Some were wrapped in straitjackets, others tied to chairs. Most were neglected. Medical treatments were barbaric, with very few patients ever released. I don't think psychiatry had a lot to offer them at that time. The stigma of mental illness in 1949 was huge. People didn't talk about having mental illness in their family. If you had a family member that went to a state hospital, that was a shame. You hid that. You covered it up. I am not surprised they sought out the clergy. And so the Reverend Schultz, who has seen this himself and doesn't know what it's all about, but does get a sense of evil, he goes back to the parents and tells the parents, this is something that Catholics understand. You better go see a priest. And what I wonder about with him is he remained skeptical and he thought it might be poltergeist Yet he referred him on to a Catholic priest, knowing that the Catholics know about exorcism. Seems to me there's a subtle suggestion there to the family that it was demon possession. Robbie's parents took Reverend Schultz's advice. They went to nearby St. James Catholic Church in Mount Rainier, Maryland, where they consulted with a Father E. Albert Hughes. Many years later, Father Hughes confided in his associate pastor, Father Frank Bober, about his encounter with the young boy. Father Hughes, at that point in time, was young, um, ordained just a few years. Hello, Father Hughes. Thank you so much for seeing us, Father. Of course. Father Hughes. Father. And you must be Robbie. How are you today? To the father, Robbie. Well, he said they were uh, very uh, uh, strange phenomena. Can we leave? Uh, one of which was Robbie. the boy was able to like look at the phone and move the phone across the room. The room was like, got extremely cold, frigid. You know, so he said those things themselves were a bit, you know, scary. Father Hughes suspected that the boy was under the influence of evil forces. He turned to the Roman ritual, a centuries-old prayer book, for guidance. The young priest opened the chapter on exorcism to study the signs of possession. He certainly came to the conclusion there was satanic uh, possession. I don't think Father Hughes was that interested in doing it himself, but he just gave the case to the Archbishop, and Archbishop of Bile asked him to do it. The rules said that an exorcist had to be distinguished for his piety, prudence, and integrity of life. They also said that he was to be of mature years. The young Father Hughes seemed an unlikely choice, but he prepared as best he could. As is customary before a priest gets involved in exorcism, um, no, you pray a lot, you fast a lot, which he did, so he prepared himself in that sense. He obtained permission to have the boy admitted to Georgetown Hospital for the ritual, though he was catastrophically unprepared for what would happen next.
Suspected of being possessed by an evil force, Robbie was brought into Georgetown University Hospital, where he was restrained to a bed. Father Hughes set about starting the exorcism. As he prepared the religious apparatus for such a ceremony, Robbie became highly agitated, thrashing wildly in the bed, pulling viciously at the restraints. As each segment of the ritual was read out, the boy erupted in a violent torrent of screaming, cursing and voicing of Latin phrases, a language he had never before studied. As Father Hughes reached the climax of the ceremony, Robbie managed to slip one of his restraints, tear a steel spring from the bed, and slashed Father Hughes' left arm from shoulder to wrist. To close the wound required more than 100 stitches. that Georgetown hospital room, Father Hughes felt he had met the devil. For him, I think he believed that uh, he was just not strong enough theologically or spiritually to deal with this. I think uh, Father Hughes felt that he was no match, <laughs> you know, for, for dealing with Satan. He mentioned, he said, oh, Oftentimes, you know, you do think that things like Satan, possession, exorcisms are not realities. There's something that's relegated to the superstitious. And he said, I for a long time thought, you know, that this was uh, something that was more in that realm too. Until I came to deal with the devil in this, in this kid's case. In order to really believe in possession, without it being a superstition. That is, some people believe in possession without having anything to hang it on to. In order to have a coherent worldview that includes possession, you've obviously got to believe in the devil or in demons. And in order to believe in the devil and the demons, you're going to have to have a wider picture that uh, includes God and the creation of the world as something good. Satan, in the history of the whole Judeo-Christian tradition, is a pure spirit, an angelic spirit, created by God, who failed the test of goodness definitively. The original image of the devil is a great fallen angel condemned to eternal hell. He is called Satan, the accuser, the supreme embodiment of evil, the tormentor of human souls. Was it the devil that compelled Robbie so violently to attack Father Hughes? Or had the ritual of exorcism itself planted the seed of suggestion in an impressionable boy? If you tell particularly a child that they're possessed by the devil, um, the child is going to act in ways that are very peculiar. Being referred to Father Hughes and having an unusual ritual performed over him was likely a very striking experience. What came to my mind was that underneath this boy was really angry about what Father Hughes was doing. And that says to me that some anger and rage were mobilized from beneath. One of the unanswered questions about this boy in this case is what was going on in his life? People say he was so normal, that the family was normal, he was normal, and then all of these things happen that we would consider to be, from a psychiatry point of view, really unusual and serious disturbances in the midst of being completely normal. 
I wonder if someone had done something to him he had not talked about. After the uh, attempted exorcism by Hughes, uh, the boy goes back home. And very shortly thereafter, the mother wakes up one morning and he's in the bathroom and she hears a scream. She goes into the bathroom and written across his chest is the word Lewis, L-O-U-I-S. She sees this word, but it's written in blood. It's as if it's been scratched on his chest. No. And she says, St. Louis, because that's where the family's from. It hurts. Is that what you want? And then the word yes appears scratched in blood on his body. They decide they're going to go to St. Louis. And they are on a train very shortly from Washington to St. Louis. Robbie and his parents travel to a relative's home in a quiet St. Louis suburb. But supernatural events continue to surround the boy. And in that house, there's a cousin who is attending St. Louis University. She goes to the parents and says, I'd like to talk to a priest about Robbie because Robbie, all the strange things that are happening in the house. The mother and father agree. She goes in and she talks to her teacher, who is Father Bishop. Father Bishop was a professor on the faculty at St. Louis University, a Jesuit institution. Bishop sought out the help of his friend, an older priest, Father William Bowden, the pastor of St. Francis Xavier Church. Father Bowden and Father Bishop visited Robbie and his family. Well, he was asked to come, and he went down, and the boy was obviously uh, distressed. And it was a bizarre kind of behavior, and, and violent, cruel, crude, and a genuine hostility to things religious, crosses and crucifixes and that sort of stuff. And Father Bowdern, believing that something is going to have to be done here, asks Father Bishop to take down everything he can about this case. And that's the beginning of the diary. The diary that was created is the most complete record of an exorcism in modern times. It would record, in spare, matter-of-fact prose, the hellish events of the next six weeks. Significantly, it made no mention of the first failed exorcism. The priests had no forewarning of the damage Robbie had inflicted when faced with a religious onslaught. Bowden's diary, which I have seen, uh, details this stuff, you know, pretty carefully. Uh, the, this young man was um, sick in ways that, you know, internal medicine just has no way of, had no way then, and I'm sure now would have no way of coping with. The diary began with Bowden and Bishop's first visits to the family's house in St. Louis as they attempted to discern what was plaguing the boy. Wednesday, March 9th. A sharp pain seemed to have struck Robbie on his stomach and he cried out. The mother quickly pulled back the bed covers and lifted the boy's pajama top, enough to show zigzag scratches in bold red lines on the boy's abdomen. Friday, March 11th. The boy was dozing when the bottle of St. Ignatius holy water was thrown from a table two feet from Robbie's bed into a nearby corner. Five minutes after fathers Bowdern and Bishop left Robbie's home, there was a heavy scraping noise in Robbie's room. A bookcase was moved from alongside the bed and turned completely around. The stool at the dressing table moved from the table to the bed about two feet. Crucifix with relics was moved from under the pillow to the foot of the bed. The relic of St. Margaret Mary was lost in the room. Father Bowdern and Father Bishop decide that there's something here that is evil that the boy is possessed, that it's necessary for there to be an exorcism. Well, technically, demonic possession means that, that a, a evil spirit has entered a person's body and taken and pushed aside their will and their mind. And so it's now the demon operating inside that person rather than the person's own will and mind. The basic discernment of the exorcist is a spiritual one. It's a discernment of good and evil. And it is the recognition of the presence of evil and more specifically of the evil one. 
the general rule of thumb is that um, if you have a alleged case of, of possession, you look at it very, very carefully. If it doesn't appear to be fraud, then you look for um, a physical problem. Is this some kind of strange disease, that uh, physical disease that brings out these odd symptoms? Well, if you've eliminated that, uh, then you look for the psychological. The most common mental illness that is mistaken for possession is multiple personality. I have treated a number of these patients, and one of the things that I have seen in my office is a person whose facial expression suddenly changes, and they take on a very eerie look in their eyes, and it's like a very angry, almost evil part of them is staring out at you. And if you don't know what you're looking at, it can sure look like demon possession. The reason he was referred to the exorcist was precisely that the psychiatrists couldn't deal with him because the problem wasn't psychiatric at all and it wasn't psychological at all. It was a problem of evil. Tuesday, March 15th. There was the usual mattress shaking. The relic of St. Margaret Mary was thrown from the pillow. The mattress movement continued for two hours. Father Bowden approached his superior, the Archbishop Ritter, with their findings. Archbishop Ritter agrees that there should be an exorcism, and he decides that Father Bowdern will be the exorcist, much to the surprise of Father Bowdern. And Father Bowdern is quoted as having saying, oh my, oh my, oh my, How do, what are you getting me into this for? I, I got other things to do. So he was backed into it, as I understand it, against, he didn't volunteer. Wednesday, March 16th, permission was granted by the Most Reverend Archbishop Joseph E. Ritter that Father William S. Bowdern might read the prayers of exorcism according to the Roman ritual. Father Bowdern calls a young Jesuit who's not yet a priest, Walter Halloran, who has driven Father Bowdern around in the parish car a few times. And he says, I want you to take me somewhere. Well, Father Bowdern got me on the way into supper, and he told me that uh, he had to go out and see some people that evening and asked me if I'd drive him. So I said, sure. Fathers Bowdoin, Bishop, and Mr. Walter Halloran arrived at the home at 10.30 p.m. I, w I went in the house, and I didn't have a f the faintest clue of what was going on. So he visited with the family for a while, and the little boy was there. And he said, well, he says, we better get down to business. So the young boy went up to his bedroom and uh, changed into his PJs, and then Bowdoin said, OK, he said, let's go. The men set about their task. A stunned Halloran witnessed a bottle of holy water fly across the room, followed by the bed's violent rocking from side to side. But these events were nothing compared to what happened next. Three large parallel bars were scratched on the boy's stomach. From then on, when the names of our Lord and his Blessed Mother and St. Michael were uttered in the ceremony, scratches appeared on the boy's legs, thighs, stomach, back, chest, and throat. Go out, thou seducer full of deceit. Oh, it's just as clear if you took lipstick and put an X on my chest. It's just as clear as that, or clearer. There are certain people who have a kind of skin reaction. Angioneurotic edema is one of the names for it. And what they do is if they take a fingernail and they touch themselves, they'll have a rather nice red raised mark. This happened a lot when I was there and uh, I could see his hands. He wasn't doing it. If his skin was incredibly sensitive, he could have rubbed against things, even when his hands were in sight, and produced some of these marks. The most distinct markings on the body were the picture of the devil on Robbie's right leg and the word hell imprinted on Robbie's chest. Then a mark appeared on his shoulder one time, and uh, it looked like the you know, caricatures of the devil, like horns. Now, if there's a real devil, why would the devil draw a picture of itself that corresponds to our fantasies of what the devil looks like? The picture of the devil appearing on him looked to me like this was real proof that something other than the supernatural was going on. Robbie prayed the rosary with the clergy at his bedside. 
The Novena prayers to Our Lady of Fatima were recited in common. On Saturday, March the 19th, the exorcist arrived at Robbie's home and the routine of the exorcism began again. Violent shoutings with fiendish laughter were part of the phenomena. On the following Monday, Robbie's mother was suffering so much from the loss of sleep, she had to be taken to a doctor. It was then decided to take Robbie to a hospital to continue the exorcism. There's a hospital in St. Louis that's run by the Alexian brothers. The Alexian brothers are a, a religious community of Catholic uh, men that date back into the Middle Ages, early Middle Ages. And they were founded to care for plague victims, take care of people that everybody else was running away from in horror. And they were willing to take the kid in. He's put in a room, uh, has no inside doorknob, bars on the windows, because it's a room in a mental ward in the hospital. And it's there that the exorcism continues. The language of Robbie became increasingly more abusive and dirty. Father Bodern decides that it would be a good idea to have the boy convert to Catholicism. Friday, April 1st with the church because he may desecrate the church. And they take the kid into the next door rectory and bring him up the stairs. Robbie laps in and out of his seizures. The regular procedure for the baptism of infants was then performed. Robbie. Do you renounce Satan and all his words and all his displays? The baptism was completed with a generous amount of baptismal water. The next day, Robbie was to receive his first Holy Communion. Saturday, April 2nd. It was evident that a struggle was at hand. When Father Bowdern began the prayers for Holy Body Communion, Robbie went into his spell, kept his eyes shut, and his mouth closed. On five different occasions, when the particle was placed in Robbie's mouth, he spit it out. After nearly two hours of vain attempts, Father O'Flaherty suggested that we pray the rosary. This time, Robbie was able to swallow, and he made his first Holy Communion under extraordinary opposition. The boy is spending day after day in the hospital. He's confined to the room. He's getting very restless. Father Halloran, who's a young guy, it feels he should get the kid out. One place that Father Halloran thinks might be a good place is the Jesuit retreat house called White House, which is on the outskirts of St. Louis on a bluff overlooking the Mississippi River. I showed them the grounds, and then they have these heroic-sized figures for the, uh, the stations of the cross. Robbie wandered among the statues depicting the life of Jesus. He became obsessed with their powerful images. When he got to the cross station, he just took off running. this far from the edge of the cliff when we stopped. And, and then he woke up right away. And he, well, he says, you know, why are you holding me down? See, he had no recollection of that whatsoever. And then I, I sort of got the chills when I thought, you know, what if the child had gone over? Thousands of people flock to hear the Archbishop Emmanuel Milingo, a modern-day exorcist. He is sought as a healer of body and spirit. When I began myself to, to deal with many possessed persons, I had to learn to see, to see what they were doing. 
They speak most of the time with languages. He was affected most. It was Holy Thursday, and uh, I asked him if he knew anything about Holy Thursday, when uh, the last, feast of the Last Supper, and the institution of the Blessed Sacrament, and everything. He said no. And I said, well, do you want to know something about it? And he said, yes. So I started telling him about the Last Supper and, and our Lord saying, this is my body and this is my blood. And uh, after I talked for a little, he says, look, he says, would you stop? So I said, sure. And, uh, and then he pulled up his, the legs of his pajamas and he had huge uh, welts running down his leg, and he had him across his stomach and on his chest. Bowdern and Bishop notice that the scratches that are continually appearing on the boy sometimes seem to produce numbers, and they try to interpret the numbers, and they come up with the idea that there's a certain number of days left for the possession by the demon. And when they start working the numbers, they say Holy Week is when this is going to end. Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, April 14th through 16th. The Holy Week for Father Bowdern, like any other pastor, is the busiest week of the year. Particularly in the old days, uh, he must have been going 12, 14 hours of pretty solid pastoral work because at the time, this was the center of the city. So while all of this is going on, while he has a day job as a pastor, at night he's going to the Alexian Hospital and continuing the relentless prayers of exorcism. And sometimes he'd be there until 12 or 1 o'clock and he'd be back up at 5 a.m. That's when he got up. So he, he was under duress. And nothing seems to be happening. The idea that this would all come to an end isn't panning out. It isn't coming to an end. It seems to be getting worse. Easter Sunday came and passed with no respite. On the evening of April, Monday the 18th, Robbie awoke in a spell, kicking at the brother by his bedside. He jumped out of bed, seized the holy water bottle, threatened to throw it at the brother, then sprinkled water towards him. Two hours later, the fathers attempted spiritual communion. Robbie uttered the words, I wish to receive you. And according to the diaries, the devil laughed and said, that isn't enough. Holy Michael, the Archangel, he quarters of an hour later, the most striking event of the evening occurred. Robbie was in a seizure, but lay calm. Suddenly, Robbie shot bolt upright, and in clear, commanding tones, and with a dignity not heard for many months, a voice broke into the prayers and shouted, Satan, Satan, I am St. Michael, and I command you, Satan, and the other evil spirits to leave the body in the name of Dominus, immediately, now, now, now. He's gone. And Dominus is the word. He's gone. Dominus the Lord. And that's the moment when the exorcism ends. In the hospital, and there are many, many witnesses to this, there's a, a sound which they describe as a gunshot. A loud, loud report. And, uh, and that was the time that the, uh, that the exorcism was over. And uh, some of the, the ones that were in there saying their office, they didn't even know about the exorcism case. When they go up, into that room and he's sitting up in the bed and he's absolutely a little boy again and he has no memory of what happened but he does have the vision of saint michael the archangel fighting the demon remarkably across town in saint francis xavier church 
several Jesuit priests reported a similar vision. It was in the evening, and all of a sudden a huge light uh, lit up the uh, sanctuary. Emanating from the light in the dome high above the main altar, the priests witnessed a vision of St. Michael. I believe that um, this case was as advertised. I believe it was demonic possession, whatever that means. No one knows how that works. You know, the, the Catholics have a good theory about how it works and about what to do to cure it. But I know that this boy was cured and, and modern science could not deal with his problem at the time. He was allowed in the state to get out feelings that wouldn't have been acceptable for him to otherwise get out. Maybe his anger had run its course. You know, if a person wants to be skeptical, um, let him be skeptical. The, all I know is that I was there and that I saw it. I think the one person that came out of uh, this exercise affected mo uh, that was affected most was Bowder. Well, the way he put it to me, again, he was an old shoe. He was not a theologian. He didn't talk so much in theological terms. He said, Dan, any seven-year-old could tell the difference between someone who is mentally ill and someone who is possessed. We cannot afford as scientists to ignore the phenomenon of evil just because we can't measure it. I firmly believe in the possibility of demonic possession. I'm not sure how that manifests itself, and I don't necessarily believe in a devil with uh, pointed ears and a tail or, you know, stoking the fires of hell with a pitchfork or something. But I do believe that there, there is a force of evil out in the world, and, uh, and conversely, a, a, a force for good. As I say, I believe that that's a battlefield within, within every human being. Later, a follow-up to the diary was written, though the author is unknown. August 19, 1951. Robbie and his father and mother visited the brothers. Robbie, now 16, is a fine young man. His father and mother also became Catholic, having received their first Holy Communion on Christmas Day, 1950. Robbie's story still haunts this Mount Rainier neighborhood. Local folklore has spawned the legend of the Devil's House and countless rumors about what really happened. In a far-off corner, a house stands as a lonely reminder of the events that took place here in the winter of 1949. For all the details contained in the diary and the testimony of those involved, there are just as many questions that remain unanswered.